you ever been taken advantage of and felt like you were powerless to do anything about it? I've heard stories of people who get into some kind of legal trouble in another country and come to realize that the only way out of it is to pay a bribe to some official. And in fact, the whole point of the legal trouble was to get that bribe, it was just to get a little bit of money out of you. A better name for it is, is extortion. Or several years ago, there were, there were many, many stories that came out of employees, usually women, enduring constant sexual harassment from their bosses because if they spoke out, they weren't believed or they were demoted or they were fired. Or maybe you work in a job with a, with a modest hourly wage and, and your employer regularly shortchanges you on the hours that you work. And when you bring it up, you're told to take what you get or find another job. But work is hard to come by, so you stick it out. Or maybe you found yourself on the other side of the equation. You're in a powerful position and you realize that it would be fairly easy to use that power to benefit yourself at the expense of others. Or you realize that it, 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 it affords you the opportunity to get away with things that you might not get away with in, in other circumstances. The misuse or abuse of power is a scary thing when you're the victim of it, and it's tempting when you're the one who has the opportunity to wield it. James speaks to this reality this morning, the, the danger, the temptation to misuse money or power in order to benefit ourselves at the expense of of others. So let's, let's read there. James chapter 5, we're going to read the first six verses. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, even when you speak hard words to us, we pray that you will give us open hearts, soft hearts, receptive hearts to hear you speak and to believe. To be willing to hear your challenge ourselves. To be willing to see our own sin, our own selfishness. And to recognize it turn from it, confess it, and learn a new way of love, of Christ-likeness. So we, we pray, speak your truth to us from your word this morning. Show us these sins where they live within us. And show us the true beauty, the eternal goodness of Jesus Christ and of laying up treasure in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So James starts in kind of a shocking way, uh, a way that perhaps we don't see all that much in the New Testament, though, though this sort of thing shows up from time to time in the prophets of the Old Testament. He says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. And it sounds like from the outset that he's talking about everyone who has, who has any sort of wealth 
at all. And yet he goes on and he gets a little bit more specific and he makes some specific charges starting in verse 4. He says, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. So it seems like he's, he's talking to wealthy landowners, to people who own large parcels of land and then had to hire people out to, to, to work and to harvest their fields, people who had developed a reputation for cheating those who were poorer out of their land and of failing to pay agreed wages to their workers. Okay? So they cheat those who are poor out of their land so that they can expand their uh, so that they can expand their parcel, and then will agree to pay their workers a certain wage and then hold back some of it from them when it comes time to settle up. Okay? So these are the these are the specific people in the in the community that James is writing to that he's addressing. But he still has some important things to say to all of us, even, even if that particular description doesn't fit all of us, okay? So first, let's talk about the spiritual dangers of wealth and more broadly of, of power, okay? The spiritual dangers of wealth and of power. The, the first thing is that the wealthy become powerful by virtue of their wealth, and it's easy to use power for our own selfish purposes, it's true in nearly every place that those with significant wealth are considerably more powerful than those who are poor. The wealthy own the businesses where the poor are employed. They own the homes that they rent. They own the businesses that sell them things. If there's a legal dispute, the, the wealthy can buy good legal representation and they can afford to go to court for a few days or weeks or months. So James is identifying the fact that with wealth comes a particular set of temptations. Being wealthy isn't sinful in itself. Owning land or a business or being a landlord is not immoral all by itself. Those things can all be done in a virtuous and neighbor-loving and God-glorifying way. But they also all come with their own particular set of temptations. Wealth provides opportunity for sins that weren't available to us when we were poor. To hold back wages, for instance, or to manufacture reasons for keeping a security deposit. But you don't have to be wealthy to know that gaining power comes with a unique set of temptations. You've seen situations where someone got even a little bit of power and used it to benefit themselves or or hurt their enemies. I remember even all the way back in school, the, the student crossing guard who would, who would let his friends cross immediately after school but keep everyone else back, make them wait until the very end, until the very last minute, and then let them cross the school. It's, it's something we don't even need to learn to do right. We, we, we just know because of, our, because of our corrupted, human, sinful natures, that even the tiniest bit of power can be exploited for our advantage. The manager at a business who listens to her friends but's dismissive of the ideas of, of everyone else. It's not bad to be wealthy, nor is it bad to be in a position of authority. But this is a heavy reminder from James that those things come with significant responsibility. And they also come with new temptations. Okay? Okay, so the wealthy become powerful and it's easy to use power for our own selfish purposes. The, the second part of this, of the spiritual dangers of, of wealth and power, is that to hoard wealth is to misuse it. Okay? To fail to help meet the needs of others is to fail to use riches for the reason that they were made. And James goes on and he talks about some of the evidence that will be presented against the rich at the last day. And he says, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you. The, the picture that he paints is of the wealthy accumulating more and more, more and more clothes, more and more stuff, more and more money, such that none of it even gets used. 
It's just accumulated and then left, not used at all. The clothes are never worn, and so they, they become moth-eaten. The stuff that we get becomes rusty and it breaks down. The money corrodes because it's just been sitting and never been used. The idea is that they accumulate more things, more money, and none of it is ever used for any good other than building up their own accounts, their own status. That they own more expensive clothes than they could ever possibly wear. They have more money than anyone could ever possibly know what to do with and they just let it sit. Let it accumulate. See, this is where we need God to tell us what the purpose of wealth is. Because wealth is never supposed to be an end in itself. Getting more is never supposed to be the goal. The goal is never supposed to be simply to have more and more. If having more is the goal, then it is never enough. Hoarding wealth and buying more and more stuff makes sense if the only purpose is just to get more, even if it'll simply go to waste. But gold, money, things are meant to provide for the needs of life. That's their purpose. Clothing is meant to help us work to provide warmth in the cold. On this passage here in James, the reformer John Calvin put it this way, God has not appointed gold for rust nor garments for moths, but on the contrary, he has designed them as aids and helps to human life. And if they're accumulated and discarded without ever serving that purpose, we are misusing the gifts of God. Okay. To hoard wealth is to misuse it. The third thing under this sort of heading of the spiritual dangers of wealth and power, to defraud the poor and fail to provide gainful employment is to be guilty of breaking the sixth commandment, the one against murder. And that's what James says in verse 6. He says, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you, which is interesting because none of the stuff that he had said beforehand talked about murder. He talked about accumulating land by fraud. He talked about hiring workers and then keeping back part of their wage from them. But he never talked about murder. He never talked about specific violence. And now in the very last verse, he says, you have, you have murdered them. Well, how can that be? It's unlikely that the wealthy that James is, is addressing here had actually physically committed the act of murder. But to cheat the poor out of their land and to deny them gainful employment is to starve them. And Sirach, which was a, a Jewish wisdom book written about 200 BC, it's a part of the apocryphal books. It doesn't have the authority of the scriptures, but it is useful for study. It does help us understand some of the thinking in the wisdom literature of the time says, to take away a neighbor's living is to murder him. To deprive an employee of his wages is to shed blood. The positive side of the sixth commandment is about the protection of life and about doing what contributes to its good, to its flourishing. And the eighth commandment requires us to give others what they are due and to restore anything that is wrongly withheld from others. So if we use our wealth and our power to enrich and benefit ourselves at the expense and the harm of others, we're failing to protect and honor the lives that God has made. James equates it with murder. If you make other people starve, no matter the way that you do it, you're guilty of murder. So heavy stuff in the first few verses of chapter 5 here. Okay, so we've talked about the, the spiritual dangers of, of wealth and of power. Let's talk about the search for justice, because James talks about this too. What should we do when we see the powerful getting away with things that they should not be able to get away with, that other people do not get away with? We like to believe that this world is ultimately a just place 
that everything works out the way that it's supposed to. And we have sayings like, what goes around comes around, that are supposed to assure us that this is the case, right? I've said that phrase. I'm sure some of you have too. But those sayings aren't always true, at least not right here, right now. And this world doesn't always or even usually doesn't provide a just reckoning for our actions. I heard someone just a few days ago talking about that phrase, what goes around comes around, saying, no, it doesn't. Usually, whatever goes around just keeps going around. And when we see that happening, and it keeps happening, we often become angry, frustrated. We want to do something. And if there is no justice, or it feels like there will never be any justice, then the temptation is to take matters into our own hands. We see that happening not not too far away from us in this world. Why not simply attack and kill those with wealth and set up our own equitable system through revolution? Or why not engage in some sort of vigilante justice? Why not riot and loot as a means of liberation? Why not take out the bad guys ourselves and have an underground cave with bats and cars and planes and stuff like that. It's always good to use the legal and moral means at our disposal to produce a more just society. But to take it upon ourselves to mete out justice using intimidation and theft or violence is to claim for ourselves what belongs only to God vengeance. In Romans 12, 19, the Apostle Paul says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And he quotes from Deuteronomy 32 there. That's where the woes pronounced here by James take their solace too. That's that's the that's the consolation that is meant to come in the midst of continued injustice. James's woes here point to the wrath of, of the judgment of God to come, point to the wrath of God, the truth of the judgment, the justice that is coming at the last day. Justice will come. Making it happen right now, in my way, no matter what it takes, no matter the cost, denies the truth of the ultimate justice of God. It makes the one responsible for making everything right. And knowing what true justice is in any given moment, it puts all of that on us and takes it away from Him. Christians can be peaceful even when victims of great injustice because we know that this world is not the one and only shot at justice. And James's remarks here are meant to be a wake-up call to the wealthy, to the powerful in the churches that read his letter to say what you think is being done in secret, what you think will never be known, what you think you have gotten away with, it is just waiting to give evidence against you at the last day. So repent of it now. Bring it into the light now. Find forgiveness now. Take responsibility for your actions now. So that you will not stand condemned, but redeemed at the last day. And if we're confronted with the truth of our own injustices, if we see the ways we've cheated others or hoarded wealth for ourselves such that it goes to waste, or we've misused our power to benefit ourselves, but but we've been content that no one knows or that I'm well protected legally, realize that the Lord knows. And your works will testify against you. So go to the Lord and find forgiveness through Jesus. 
Repent and set things right as best you can. Restore what you can restore. Make the truth known. And live as generously and charitably with your fellow man as you can. So that's going to lead us into the last thing. So, so what do we do? What do we do? What are we meant to take from, from a passage like this? First, lay up treasure in heaven. Either we'll hoard wealth now and it will testify against us at the last day, or we can lay up treasure in heaven. We can recognize that the most important thing and the most valuable thing that we can have in this life and in the next is, is an inheritance that cannot be destroyed by rust or moth, that cannot be stolen by thieves, cannot be squandered away. But, but an inheritance in the, in, the, in the kingdom of God is, is eternal. And it doesn't spoil. And if we have that, if we know that the costliest thing that we own is our membership in the household of God, is the promise of a world made new, is the Holy Spirit who's been set as a down payment inside of us for the glory that is still yet to come, then that's going to affect the way that we live now. It's going to mean repentance and faith. It will mean seeing our sin, confessing it, setting it aside, and finding the new way of obedience to walk with God and to love Him and love others. And it will mean that we use the wealth that we have here differently as well. It will mean that we use it for its intended purpose. We provide for ourselves warmth and food and clothing for ourselves, for our families. We provide for their future and for ours. That's not a bad thing. But that which we don't need, that which is simply going to sit and go to waste, that which will never be used, that which will serve human good in no perceptible way, give it away. Help provide for the needs of others. It's the mark of those who know that, or one of them anyway, of those who know that our greatest treasure is in heaven. Okay, all right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, teach us to lay up our treasure in heaven. to know that our greatest possession is Jesus Christ and His kingdom. And so teach us not to use our wealth or our power to benefit ourselves at the expense and the harm of others. But help us learn to live providing for our needs and with what is left over providing for the needs of others. Lord, our, our money and our things so easily, so quickly become an idol. Root that idol out of our hearts and set our affections instead on the Lord Jesus and on His treasure that can never be lost, never squandered, never stolen, never corrupted, never corroded. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.